I know self-publishing is not for everyone. Nothing is. But if you've considered self-publishing for even a minute, listen up. Because I'm betting I know what's holding you back from exploring it further or getting started. Number one, you think the self-publishing process is a lot harder than it actually is. And number two, you're understandably afraid of doing it, air quote, wrong. So I've created a new free resource for you. It's called the Self-Publishing Starter Kit, and you can get instant access to it by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting publishaprofitablebook.com forward slash self-publishing 101. In this free training, you'll discover the exact four steps to focus on and mistakes to avoid so you can publish an incredible book that's indistinguishable in quality from a New York Times bestseller without overthinking, overguessing, or overspending in areas that won't make a difference. Again, visit publishaprofitablebook.com forward slash self-publishing 101 to get instant access. Welcome to the Write the Damn Book Already podcast. My name is Elizabeth Lyons. I'm a six-time author and book editor, and I help people write and publish powerful, thought-provoking, wildly entertaining books without any more overthinking, second-guessing, or overwhelm than absolutely necessary. Because let's face it, some overthinking, second-guessing, and overwhelm is going to come with the territory if you're anything like me. I believe that story and shared perspective are two of the most potent ways we connect with one another and that your story, perspective, and insights are destined to become someone else's favorite resource or pastime. For more book writing and publishing tips and solutions, oh, and plenty of free and low-cost resources, visit publishaprofitablebook.com. And for recommendations of fabulous books you've possibly never heard of, book writing inspiration, and the occasional meme so relatable you'll wonder if it was created with you in mind, follow me on Instagram at Elizabeth Lyons Author. Well, I was really glad for this interview to happen because if you have been listening to this podcast for any period of time, you have undoubtedly heard me speak of Neely Tubati Alexander. The only reason that you would not have heard me speak about Neely is if you were listening to the first I don't know, six or seven episodes, which aired before I met Neely. And ever since then, she just comes up all the time to where I challenge myself each episode to mention her. Even if I just say, I don't know, I just come up with something little. The bottom line is she's absolutely remarkable and she's such a great source of information. She is my critique partner for the novel I'm working on. It's the first novel I've written. And let me tell you, it's way different from writing nonfiction. But her debut, Love Buzz, came out in 2023. And her second book, she had a two book deal with HarperCollins in a not so perfect world comes out on March 19th. I will list a link to everything, the books, the social media, the website, as I do in the show notes. I was so excited to talk to Neely about what was different about book two, specifically the launching of it, uh, the writing of it, any pressure that she felt to sell more copies than she did of Love Buzz, if she even knew how many copies of Love Buzz she'd sold, how her writing process has evolved. And this is something that I've found to be really fun over time is being able to talk to an author more than once and find out what is different, what changes between one book or from one book to the next, and how they navigate that, how they choose to see what could be seen as negative, as positive, and how they make whatever choice they've made in terms of their publishing platform, whether it's changed between books or stayed the same, how they make that work for them and why they continue to decide on that particular platform for them. Because again, there is no right or wrong or good or bad, unless we're talking about vanity, which I've mentioned many, many times. It's just what works best for you and for each individual book that you are working on. So without further ado, let's get to the second interview with Neely. I think it's really good that I'm having you on again, because if people haven't heard, if the, well, I talk about you all the time, as you know. And so if people didn't hear our first episode together, Um, They might be like, God, Elizabeth talks about Neely in like every episode. 
And so now I feel like this is some sort of thing where people can be like, okay, Neely's not afraid of her. (laughs) (laughs) Only mildly afraid. (laughs) Exactly. A normal amount of afraid. Just a normal amount of afraid. All right. So book two in a not so perfect world, which of course I have comes out. Is it this Friday? No, March 19th. So we are two weeks away. That's okay, still so I, weeks. I don't even know what two weeks, right? Yes. Yeah, t- about two weeks. And I'm so excited to hear all the things about the second book and how this has been different from the first book. I mean, you and I have talked privately about a little bit of it, but what you are, what's most notable to you as far as sharing with people, like what's, what, what was the most different? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm on a, Discord group that is for um, 2023 debuts. And I've been a part of it since 2022, just sort of as all of our announcements were coming out and slowly people found the group. And we recently had a call with the 2024 state group, 2024 debut group to kind of pass on wisdom, talk about, you know, what our experiences were. And it was so it all, all HarperCollins authors. I'm just curious. Um, it's all, it's any traditionally published authors. Got so you. If you have a traditionally published book, your first traditionally published book coming out in that year, then you would, I guess, qualify for this group. And it was it was just so interesting to hear people's stories and feedback and kind of what they had to say to these, you know, only 12 months behind you, right? I mean, not very far, but just how jaded we all already were with the industry a little bit. And, um, you know, what our experiences had been and, you know, this is code for this in the publishing industry and, right. and not jaded, but like how much we actually had learned. Right. Um, and that doesn't mean, I don't mean to say jaded in terms of everything was negative and horrible. It's, it's been an amazing two years, but it was just interesting to hear everyone's stories and you really get that collaborative um, understanding of, okay, there are issues everywhere. It's not necessarily just my publisher or just, you know, this house or just, and I've had a great experience, don't get me wrong. It's more just sort of how you exist within the publishing space, not necessarily about a specific imprint or a specific publisher. So it was really interesting to hear how everyone's, you know, dynamic and and thought process about it had changed over time, over a relatively short period of time too. Yeah. And I, I love that you said, you know, because that's one of the most important things to me to help, I hate this phrase so much, but pull back the curtain on is it's not about If you get traditional, if you go traditional, if you go hybrid, if you go self, if you go with Harper, like, and then even to boil it down further in the traditional world, if you go with Harper, if you go with Penguin, if you go, everything will be great or everything will not be great. There's so much, there's just so many different experiences and it seemingly can even depend on, did you sign your contract on a Tuesday or Like, did you get your hair done the day before you signed your contract? It's just across the board. And I think the more people come to accept that as truth, the more they'll let their expectations. It's not about lowering your expectations, really. It's just managing them, right? So that you can just ride whatever wave presents itself. Yeah. And I think part of it is, is the industry itself and part of it is our own expectation and there's sort of fault to be had on both sides. Right. Um, we build up this thing that's a dream and that we want for so long. And so you're naturally going to be some level of disappointed once you achieve it and look around and realize your life is basically the same. Um, you know, even after you achieve it and if, if not the same, just with more work (laughs) or more expectation or more pressure. Right. And, you know, as an industry and just even outside of authorship, but just for artists in general, there is this general sense of like the the starving artist phrase exists for a reason. Um, It doesn't necessarily go hand in hand that because you are creatively pursuing a career that you were, that money is going to come along with it, right? Or that sustainability is going to come along with it. That's one of the big things that I've learned this year too, is that there's really never a, a level of stability because I was lucky enough to have a two book deal with HarperCollins. This book in a not so perfect world that's coming out now is 
the second of, of those two books. And so right now, my editor at Harper has my book three for them to review as part of their first look per my contract. And then who knows what's going to happen from here. So, you know, there is no guarantee that that book sells or when it sells or how much it sells for. Um, so you're always sort of on this cycle of, of um, hoping that you get to the next stage. And that's the reality for most authors. Yeah. And I'm hearing that more and more, which I don't think is the most common, and it might just be where I was hanging out or what I was listening to for a period of time, but it wasn't the most common sentiment. And now I'm hearing it more, which I appreciate because I think that when you can hear an author who not only you assume is having a level of success, but you know is having a level of success, and I don't just mean their bank account. I mean, you know, they're moving books, they're touring, they're doing events, they are growing their social media, they're whatever it is. And they even are brave enough to admit, I'm like, you hear you're only as good as your last book, um, or you're only as happy as your least happy child or phrases like this. In the book space, it's like, you don't know if the last book you sold is going to be the last book you sell. Yeah. And it's, you know, I hate to make it sound all doom and gloom. I mean, obviously we do this because we love it. Right. And there are some amazing highs as part of this process, but yeah, there is, you know, I don't know that I would ever feel, I don't know what it would take to make me feel like I have a level of stability in this industry that I am comfortable with. And I don't know what that answer would be. Um, You know, I would have told you three years ago that the advance that I got at a big five, that that would be it. And now that I have it, I I wouldn't say that, right? So yeah. um, it's interesting to see how people continue to do this. And it's, it's also unfortunate because it creates a barrier for people and it creates this, these socioeconomic challenges, right? And, and being able to write books shouldn't depend on your personal ability to sustain a side hustle, if you will, right? right. And right. that's the unfortunate part of it is that we don't get the exposure that we should to kind of every potential author that's out there because of some of these barriers. But let's bring it back to expectations just for a second, because back in the day, like my father, for example, who's 78 years old, worked for the same company from the day he essentially, from the day he graduated college until the day he retired. That is almost unheard of now. Mm -hmm. So this idea of job security in any field is is so different. People are switching jobs now every, I mean, sometimes every few months just because they get laid off through no fault of their own. So the book industry is no different from that. I mean, do, do you feel differently? Well, I think there's some benefit to that, right? Now more, it's not just people being laid off, but it's people choosing to leave organizations that don't serve them and sure. looking for alternatives and more, more. And so I'd say that the same is true in the publishing space where you have the ability to go play the field a little bit, right? If you are in a position to be able to do so. And that is powerful because it takes some of the the imbalance of power that has typically existed in this space and moves it to to authors. We see new publishers popping up that are not just the big five and who have diverse ways of um, how they approach publishing books. And there are more alternatives than there used to be some of which are great, some of which are not, right? But but there are, the point is there are more options. And so I think with those more options comes a lot more ability for authors to have more control over their careers and their books and what happens to them. So um, any more balancing of power, I'm, I'm in favor of. So I think that it can yeah. be a good thing to see some of that lack of, of loyalty, if you will. Sure, sure. Can we talk about sales numbers? Not specifics necessarily, but one thing I I posted a couple of weeks ago about a friend of mine who self-published, who Mm -hmm. messaged me and said, I'm, you know, the last time I talked to you, I had just sold my 2000th copy of my book. I just sold 3,500, number 3,500. She knows that. And so what was interesting is when I posted that to my stories, a couple of my friends who are traditionally published messaged and said, how does she even have those numbers? Like, I can't get my publisher 
to give me the numbers. And and what they were saying was, it's not that they can't or won't give you the numbers. It's that they're harder to come by in the traditional world because they're coming in at different times from different sources. You've got returns. Whereas if you're self-published, you have much more knowledge of that data. But how was the transition for you from Love Buzz to In and Not So Now? We're not there yet, but how are you feeling about what the numbers were, or did you have a good sense of what the numbers were for Love Buzz? And then how did that affect not just the tr- not just your publisher's expectation, but your expectation and the pressure uh, for book two? How do you manage all of that? Yeah. So I would just say quickly in response to whether or not you can see numbers, I don't think Harper Collins, for example, has any problem finding their numbers when it comes to their overall sales goals and, you know, hitting their numbers and things like that. Is it a complicated system for, because of returns yeah. and things like that? Yes. Um, but I'm Do still- they have a process though to like, it, and not speaking of HarperCollins specifically, but I'm sure. now I'm curious in the traditional world and we'd need a little more data to flesh this out, but because you're right, it's a business. So of course they know what their numbers are. Mm-hmm. So do you, th- do you think they're just not as readily- like, are they not able to just go into a database and say, you've sold 1,674 books? Does it take more time for them to get well, the I think, ledger? I, I think that authors are sometimes an afterthought. And I don't think that's in a mm-hmm. malicious way, right? right. Um, but we know that when you start here and there are 17 layers, that communication breaks down. And you can sometimes forget that an author, that you are their only source of of information when right. it comes of these things. So again, I don't think it's it's malicious. I think that it's just a communication breakdown often. And we, we do get royalty statements. I mean, that's that's not to say that you don't get to see what you what you are making. But to go sure. to answer your actual question, I think that um yes, so no, sales numbers absolutely and I think that's where my my agent is really great because timing matters, right? When your second book is going to come out, when you go on out on submission with another book, you know, should it come, should that happen before a book comes out? Should it happen right after a book comes out? And thinking about what those sales numbers will mean for your next opportunity. Um, that's a new process, right? Because this is the first time I would be going potentially out on submission without or with sales numbers. Right. Um, when you're a debut, it's hard because no one knows who you are and you haven't built a name for yourself. But it's also also great because there's a world of possibility and you could, you know, they go into that looking at you as potentially like a fresh new voice and it's exciting right. and interesting. And you're seeing a lot of publishers picking up debuts for that reason, right? That it's a fresh new voice and an opportunity for someone to break into the marketplace. Once you have a few books out, there is an established brand. There is an established, you know, here's what the sales numbers are. And those things are a factor for that are looked at. So this would be the first experience that I have going through it with those things being a factor. So um, I'll be really interested to see how much of a role it plays, but I certainly, I certainly know that it's going to play a role. For book three Mm -hmm. or what? Okay. Do you think it played a role at all with book two or were the numbers not really fully? Well, no, because you had a two book deal. So it was a given. Yes. Yes and no. So I think they still, I, I, and I say think, right? Because none of this, all of this is sort of like what you hear from other people and your sure. experience and sort of feeling around it. And that's part of the challenge, right? Is that there isn't a real communication around. Here's how we pick our 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 lead titles. And here's how we decide these things. Here's how we decide how much of an advance someone's going to get. And I think if we saw those answers, they wouldn't do much for us in terms of of building faith in the way that those processes happen. Because, you know, I think what we learned from the Penguin Random House trial was that these things are fairly random and they're not being, these decisions are not being made in a really data-driven way and really thoughtful way sometimes, right? So for me, when it was a two book deal, they've already paid me in advance and they know what that advance costs them. So it would be in their best interest to do what they can from a marketing and publicity perspective, regardless of what book one sales are, um, because they've already invested in the book. Now, could so I think that that impacts more of do we acquire book three? versus, you know, are we going to change our plan or strategy around book two? Because we already own it. So that's what I wanted to ask you about next. I actually, if we can fast forward to to book three, just in terms of the process part of it. So when you released book one or when you got the the deal and therefore you were writing book two or you were honing book two, right? You already had a deal for it. It was already a, a done deal. But now three is on submission. How did your 
I don't want to say your writing process because maybe that whether that changed or not could be dependent on a couple of different factors, not just not knowing if you were going to get if you were going to sell it. But was there added pressure on you? Did you feel a different way about writing and drafting book three than you did about one or two? It was probably about naive of me, but no. And I think it's because I was so early on in the process. I mean, I started writing book three probably before book one or right around the time book one was coming out. Okay. So it was so far, I was so, and I think thankfully, right, so far removed from the point that we were going to be at with this. It was certainly in the back of my mind, but I don't think it changed the way I wrote the book. And I think I've been really cognizant. That's the other thing too, in terms of what's changed, right? Once you have a book out or a book or two out and how you go about your process is that, you know, I, with book one, especially when ARCs went out, I I read reviews, I did all the things, right? And then I found it influencing what I did in my editorial process for book two. And I didn't like that um, because you can't cater to everyone in terms of here's what we liked, here's what we didn't. If there are themes or if there were like egregious things, right, then I'm happy to hear those. But ultimately, if it's... um you know, you didn't like this character or you didn't write whatever it might be. I can't come back and fix that for a completely separate book with separate characters with separate, you know, a whole separate plot. So um, to me, it's been healthier to sort of tr- try to protect the bubble as much okay. as okay. Um, I think that's really important, not only for the integrity of the writing process, but just for mental health too. So what what do you mean specifically by protect the bubble? So are you saying like, only share with certain people or don't share until you're at a certain point in the writing or, and, or, cause these could all be con- uh, combined, be, I don't know, keep reminding yourself that it's your story, your book, your characters. How does that look for you? Yeah. It's less about whether or not I share. I mean, I'm still a big proponent of beta readers and getting eyes on it. And with this book in particular, there's a courtroom element. I sought out, you know, specific people to review specific things for it. So that it's not that it's more around the trying to cater to or fix subconsciously or not, right? Fix the things that maybe reviewers pointed out in the previous book or that you, mm. you know, wish you could have done differently or that you've learned now that you didn't know before. So it's more so protecting the bubble to me is more so not trying to write the book that you think the market needs or, you know, write what I think my agent would want. Um, and I say that generally, right? I certainly take her notes, but in terms of trying to write the book that has the best opportunity for commercial success, no one knows what that means, right? It's sort of right. like in a bottle. So if you try to emulate it or try to try to, you know, write the thing, it doesn't feel genuine. So to me, it's more just write the book that I feel like I want to and need to write. And then hope that, which hope is never a good strategy, but just sort of hope <laughs> that, you know, that it's the well, right. That sucks because I rely on it daily, but <laughs> right. And then just kind of hope that it's going to be the right thing. But that to me right. is sort of the integrity of the writing process. I would find myself miserable if I was trying to cater to what I think I'm supposed to be writing. Oh my God, me too, for sure. So what was something that you learned after book one or book two that you might have been thinking, I don't, this is no a no-go. Like now that I know this, I don't want to do this anymore. But maybe you were able to pivot the thought a little bit through talking to other people and think, well, may, okay, like maybe this is more normal than I thought it was. For example, not selling as many books as you anticipated or um, having your editor switch or ha- like whatever. Was there something that you're just now accepting more as this is just part of the industry? Yeah, I think the there are a few, but I would say one is the lack of control. And you learn that very quickly, but you continue to experience it. It doesn't go away. It doesn't change, right? You you have very little control over so many things in this industry and in this process. And so it is a lesson truly in letting go of control. I think that's a big one. And being coming more comfortable with that, um, I think, has been an important lesson and something that I continue to work on because that's not an easy thing for any of us to do, especially when you've spent a year of your life, you know, putting something together. And then the other, I think, is the, you know, the goalpost is always moving as, right. as as it always is with any goal that you have, right? And so it is important to not compare to what everyone else is getting, right? What deal someone got, what, you know, so-and-so got 
Reese or so and so got is on the new, debuted on the New York Times or whatever it is, and it's hard to not compare and really stay in your lane and understand that your journey is unique and not going to be like anyone else's. It sounds so trite, but it really is true that that because that will then take the joy out of all of it. And you know, when you look back at like the goalposts and remembering to actually celebrate those those goalposts instead of just moving immediately moving the needle, right? Right. So how do you set your goalposts? Do or do you? I mean, you know, for book book the difference specifically between 1 and 2, but how do you do that? I think I've actually so I have a master list which is like the ultimate career list, right? Which is probably wouldn't be a surprise to anyone the things that are on it. Um New York Times list at some point, right? And these are I don't have so I don't necessarily have goals from book to book, but I do have like the ultimate over the course of my career. Um I would say that my goals my true kind of goals have have gotten smaller with each book because I I want to be more realistic about what I actually want from each one. So, you know, it used to be I want all of those things and I still do. They're still there. That master list is still in my drawer. But I more so now than anything else, my goal is to be able to get to the next book. And if I get the opportunity mm-hmm. to get to the next book and continue to do this, that to me is really everything that I want, right? And then everything yeah. else is potentially... Um, comes as a result of that, but really that is the goal. Have you launched or are you launching the second book in any way differently from Love Buzz based on your experience with Love Buzz? Yeah, that's a great question. Yes. So when I first came in, and I'm so amazed by some of my friends who are 2024 debut authors because they just have their stuff together so well. They have newsletters, they have followers, they have you know, they post so well on social media. And I'm like, gosh, I had I knew none of this when I when Love Buzz was coming out. And so I I very much kind of sat back and did what um, you know, if marketing or publicity did something for me, great. If they didn't, great. You know, this they're the experts. I'm gonna put it all in their hands. And the thing that I've realized is that regardless of how you publish, you are very much responsible for your marketing and publicity. And with the big five or publisher, traditional publishers in particular, you know, they're putting out so many books and they have so few resources internally. And so if there is anything unique or creative or different that you want to do with your book, so for example, In a Not So Perfect World has a gaming element. And I was like, gosh, I would love to do something around, you know, to to talk about STEM and, you know, gaming element of this book. But they don't necessarily have a team of people that are sitting around, you know, brainstorming ideas the way we might see in film or TV about, you know, what is the marketing and publicity campaign going to be for this book? They do some of that for sure, but they just don't have the resourcing to build these you know, completely 100% customer unique marketing strategies for each book. So I'd say anything that is unique or different from kind of the standard, here's what we would do from a marketing and publicity perspective for a book is on you as the author. And so I didn't really know that, um, or, and I probably should have with, with Love Buzz, but I did take on more ownership around where I thought I, my book could fit, who I wanted to see it in the hands of. And I was definitely more vocal this time. Reviews. (laughs) <laughs> talk about reviews. So Goodreads, when we've talked about this privately, but Goodreads has been such a hot topic lately. And I, you know, getting reviews, what's your experience? First of all, do you have any, I don't want to say tips and tricks, because I just, I'm so tired of all the vernacular around this, but getting people to write reviews specifically for Amazon is just not the easiest thing in the world. And then of course, a lot of reviews don't post. So people go out and submit them. They're thrown out for one reason or another. It, it, we could go down that whole list. We don't need to right now. But um, w- And then, of course, there's very little, if any, oversight of reviews on Goodreads. And you and I have both heard many times, reviews are for the readers, not for the authors. Don't go read your reviews. How does it impact you, though? Do you read your reviews? Do you, uh, do you absorb any of it? Do you pay attention to any of it? How does that work for you? Yeah, I will say I've definitely quickly developed a much thicker skin. Um, and you think you have to in this process, right? We as authors don't have the luxury of being precious about our work. And that gets sort of taken out of you really quickly just through the editorial process too. Um, 
I do look at reviews when ARCs come out because these are the first time that the book is getting, you know, into people's hands who don't have a vested interest in its success. And, and who know the books, like they're not, they're, they're not biased. In other words, they're not just out there trying to say something nasty. They're yeah. And, um, and so it's the first sort of view into how is this book going to be received? And so I think sure. that's important. And I will say, even with, um, in a not so perfect world, one of the first Goodreads reviews that came in from an ARC reader pointed something out. And I thought, yeah, you know, they're right. And, and I was still in the editorial process. So I was able to go back and, and it was a very small change, but I was able to go back and make that change. And I found that very mm-hmm. valuable. So, you know, I do look at them for, for that type of information. Once the book has come out, I largely don't just because I, there's nothing I can do at that point. Right. So I think once it's at the point where the book is is out in the world, I will say that I think it's a helpful, if you have the ability to do it without it affecting you, which I, I don't know anyone who does, right? Right. But I would say that there is there is value in the trends of it. So if you have a vast majority of people saying the same thing, it's probably worth paying attention to. Um, and I think that that's valuable and important. And I don't want to go on a full diatribe about reviews and BIPOC authors, but there is a component that exists there too, especially in romance, where um, you know there there should be a full study. I don't want to be the one that has to do it, but there should be a full study. <laughs> around, you know, the overall ratings of romance books written by BIPOC authors compared to white authors and their white counterparts, because the reviews are significantly lower across the board. Really? Absolutely. And you, you know, and this is anecdotal, of course, because again, I haven't done the, but you can, you can see the trend. It doesn't take a lot to see the trends. And so there's a component of that as well, where, um, you know, you get a lot of feedback, like, and I'm not even speaking for myself. I'm I've I've looked in, at others as well, where and talked to other you know authors. But it's there's a lot of you know I don't know why I just couldn't connect to these characters, or I didn't find myself rooting for their love story. And um, you know that seems to be a consistent level of of feedback, and then therefore a lower rating as a result. So you know there are a lot of factors I think from a rating perspective that we can't internalize. That's just really interesting. Healthy. And I don't know why I'm 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 not shocked, but I'm surprised, I guess. It's such an interesting, I mean, not to go down the Goodreads rabbit hole here, but Goodreads and even sometimes Amazon, but are so interesting when you look at reviews because so many times reviews aren't even about the book. It's just that someone's chosen platform to say something not nice on that particular day. Right. Well, and it's so funny because um, I was <laughs> the things that make people, and again, this is one of the it's it's the beautiful and scary thing about putting art into yeah. the world, right? Yes. It's that you, you everyone receives it differently based on their own sleight of circumstances and their own place in their life. And you may read one book on one day, given where you are in your life and hate it. And you may read that same book on another day and love it. That's why it truly is so subjective. But I remember I was looking at, I don't know how I went down this rabbit hole, but I was looking at the Goodreads reviews for um, Christina Forrest's debut, The Partner Plot. And I ended up on the one-star reviews and there were at least three that I saw that said the main the the male main character, so the love interest, um, does not like cats. And therefore, they had given <laughs> the book one star. And that stuck with me so much because I just realized in that moment... That this people are insane. Out of, but it's just so truly out of your control. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's very... And then you see sometimes people will leave, you know, negative reviews or or low reviews... And then you look at their their bio and their average rating is like a 1.5. No, no, that's the thing. Like, it's almost like Uber. I didn't even, I've, I've only taken an Uber a couple of times. So I didn't, because, you know, I never leave my house. So I didn't realize that Uber riders can also be rated. Mm-hmm. And so like, there are certain Uber riders who have an average one one star rating. But if you go and you look at people who have written truly absurd reviews that are not even based on anything logical whatsoever, you'll see that they have, in some cases, I'm not even exaggerating, thousands of reviews they've written that are all 
one star. It's like vigilante justice or something on their part. I don't know. It's 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 a, it's a crazy thing. But I got a one star review once many years ago. It was probably 10, 15 years ago on my first book because someone ordered the paperback or thought they did and they received the Kindle. Oh, gosh. So they left a one star review. I mean, to, so to your point about it's out of your control, what would you have me do about that, sir? <laughs> yeah, I will say so. One of the ARC reviews uh, for World, one, again, one of the first ones that came in, I think it was a two star review, but it just said chaotic hot mess. And I don't disagree <laughs> at all. So I, I, you know, I'm like, I think I'm just going to take that review and make it my new profile. Because I don't disagree at all. (laughs) But that's one of the, so I think that's one of the most fun things to do. And I don't know what this says about my personality, but when you get just a crazy review like that, to have some fun with it, Mm -hmm. right? And so what was the, what did you say the other day? You put it in your story. Someone left a review, I think of, not left a review, but gave you a, like a tagline. And you said, this is going to be my tagline now. Do you remember what that oh, was for, for perfect for in a not so perfect that. world? Yeah, I don't remember what the words it's were. Something about smut. Yeah, slightly smutty and something. <laughs> it was yeah. awesome. But it was perfect. It was awesome, right? Yeah. And they weren't trying to be nasty. To be clear, no, that wasn't. No. But what I'm saying is, sometimes you can take other people's feedback and just have fun with it because it's like, did this just happen? Like, I I don't, you know. All right. So two more questions. One, you are writing, you are cranking out books. I mean, as you know, I'm just trying to get through chapter three of mine right now. You are just cranking them out. I think we had a phone call maybe a month ago and you're like, well, I've written 30,000 words. And I thought, oh my God, I've written 30,000 words in the last nine years. Um, But you're doing that. You've got two young-ish kids and you've still got your full-time job. How one thing that people are always wondering, because of course it's so common to say, I don't have time to do this. Like, when will I fit in my writing? What, how do you do it? And has it changed from Love Buzz? Yeah, it has. You know, with Love Buzz as my debut, there was no um, timeline, there was no deadline, right? So I had, I could have taken 10 years to write it if I wanted to, but I always feel this sense of, discomfort and like, I want to get it done. I want to get it done. I want to get it done. So that's a little bit of what fuels me. I think Um, now it is a truly like wanting to keep up with a book, a year timeline. So that also drives me in a different way and in a, you know, a a more pressure filled capacity, I think, whereas before it was all personal. Now I feel external pressure to do it as well, but I still view it as positive motivation to be able to do so. You know, I think a big part of it is understanding how and when you work best Mm -hmm. and creating those opportunities for yourself. And I don't think I can say for anyone else what that looks like, right? I've heard, you know, Stephen King has said, write eight eight hours a day. Okay, well, no one can do that. Not working moms, at least, right? So for me, for example, um, a, a big change for me and a big thing that opened a, a nice window was when both of my kids were at the same, I started going to the same school on the same schedule and that opened up time. Um, I tend to write in the morning when I have the best creativity and then save my real work for when I have less brain power, because it requires less brain power, quite frankly. If I were to save the writing till the end of the day after, you know, the kids have gone to bed, whatever else, then I will find an excuse to not do it. It's like working out, right? You got to right. kind of wake up, knock it out before you can tell yourself all the excuses not to. That's how I operate. But I think the most important thing is for people to figure out what works best for them and try to create a routine around that time. Well, one of the things I've I've admired about you is how you, one of the many, of course, how you seem to be able to sit down and just write crap. And I'm not, I'm not saying that what you're writing is crap. I'm saying that the first draft of everything I firmly believe is like not not the best. And so you just, has have you always been like that with writing where you can just kind of sit down and truly work it out as you're writing without any perfectionist tendencies, without needing to know what's going to happen three chapters later? I'm much better at it now than I used to be. 
And I, I've i reached the point where I truly believe that the first draft, again, for me, doesn't work for everyone, right? Yep. But the, for me, the first draft is this unconscious stream of just telling myself the story. When I had, when I hit that 30,000 word mark for this book four, I essentially had a really thorough uh, outline, right? That wasn't even necessarily a draft. It was basically a really thorough outline. Mm -hmm. And I jumped around. I have all kinds of notes of things to come back to. I have a lot of XX and fill in later. And I, for me, I have to be okay with, and I have to trust that I have the ability to go back and fix it later. And I am in a very easily distracted person. You know, I will go down the, you know, this is my writing time, but I'm 30 minutes in and I'm looking at TikTok. I, I do all of those things too. <laughs> um, and that's why I have to write that way because I know that if I yeah. stop, if I click out of the screen, then that is a potential 30 minute you know, spiral into something else that I I don't want to do. So I yeah. have to be really disciplined about don't look it up right now, even if it's just a word. Yes, don't look it up right now because that word, that one word, will also potentially end up in a thirty minute spiral. So exactly. I'm so really, do you just leave like a blank? Do you I sometimes leave, I tell people put brackets, put a space, I leave an XX, and I highlight it. Yep. And I come back to it, and I've done that for entire chapters. Like yeah. This, is going to be this. And then I move on to the next thing because I don't know quite know what I want it to look like yet. Yeah. So, um, to me, it's a very, very unconscious stream. And I used to hear authors say things like that where they would say, you know, oh, the first draft is crap. And I would sit there thinking, well, your crap and my crap are probably very, very different. Um, but no, it really is all crap. <laughs> One of my favorite notes that I've ever seen. I don't tell me if you remember why I saw this note, but you had sent me something and in the margin, you had written to yourself, do better. It was, <laughs> that doesn't so, surprise me. So now when I go back and I'm reading through what I've written, I just put do better. It's like, I hear it's it. Really in helpful note. Yeah. It's my Neely note. Like just do better. This is, mm -hmm, this yeah, is here. not going to work out. Yeah. It's typically received really well by your future self. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like I get so mad until I'm like, oh, I wrote that. <laughs> okay. Well, there we are. Um, all right. You know, I think you know what I'm going to ask you now, but what are you reading right now? Ooh, um, I am reading. So I went back to read Romantic Comedy by Curtis Steinfeld. Oh my gosh. I have that right over on. Yes. My I had not yeah, read it yet. And it's been sitting, I've had it since it was an, I got it as an arc and I just had other things. I didn't read it. I couldn't, uh -huh. get, but it's, fantastic. I'm it is really, good. really enjoying it. And then I just read um, a bound manuscript to blurb um, that is, that was also really great. It was very, um, my blurb essentially called it Sally Rooney um, and Lily with echoes of Sally Rooney and Lily mm -hmm. King. It's very, um, it has that, all of that same sort of, I don't even know how to describe that, but like the angst and the realness and the like raw authenticity of how people are, I suppose. Mm. Um, that is a book called what it's like in words by Eliza Moss. I think it's coming out in December. So that was a, that's going to be a really fun one to look forward to too, but I just finished that one. Okay. Well, I'll of course link them and then I'll go buy them and not the first one. Cause I already have that. So yay for me. Um, because that'll be one less, they're just <laughs> coming in more quickly. Like I'm even looking behind you and people can't see this, but at your bookshelf, because first of all, it's so beautifully color coordinated. But second of all, I'm like, do I need any of those? I can <laughs> borrow any of them that you <laughs> right. you're not going to go shopping in your bookshelf. Yes. Um. All right. Well, thank you. I will link everything in the show notes as I always do. And of course, I will ask you to come back for book three and then book four and then book five. And for everyone listening, you'll just, they'll hear me mention you in every episode because that is what I challenge myself now to do. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, this is your friendly reminder to follow or subscribe, leave a quick review, and share it with someone you know has a great story or message, but isn't sure what to do next. Also, remember to check out publishaprofitablebook.com for book writing resources and tips, and to see all the ways we can work together to get your book out into the world. Again, thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk with you again soon.